So Steve Nash, who is a University of Arizona graduate in 1997, mm -hmm. and then spent some time up at uh, the Field Museum in Chicago, mm -hmm. and is now at the Denver v Museum of Natural History, uh, is our speaker tonight. And he's spent a great deal of his uh, career time working with and advancing the understanding of the work of Paul Sidney Martin. So without further ado, Steve Nash. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Bill. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to come down here and participate in Archaeology Cafe, because if you go online to the YouTube channel, you'll recognize that it's a who -who of who's who of Southwestern Archaeology, and you ain't made it into the Hall of Fame until you've done Archaeology Cafe right here. So I think I made it. If I get out of here alive, I made it. So anyway, thank you. Um, I want to flash back in time and then come back to, the, to 2014, flash back again, flash back up to 2014 and so on. Right now, the first thing I want to do is give you some stories about myself and how I got into this crazy position. But 17 and a half years ago, on or about March 28, 1997, I defended a dissertation here at the University of Arizona on the history of true ring dating. It was the same day that the University of Arizona basketball team won the national championship. <laughs> It was the shortest dissertation defense ever. <laughs> you want to sit there and talk about your pride and joy, and your committee members are looking at their watches saying, Steve, we got to go. So anyway, so I defended the dissertation. Wonderful. Tucson, University of Arizona, fantastic. But then I'm unemployed. Um, I got a job with the, no, the next day, I had a job putting cactuses onto a semi-trailer that's being shipped to the Netherlands. I'm not kidding. There was a, for many, many years, there was a big industry here when construction was going up in Phoenix or Tucson basins. The cactuses would be um, shipped over to the Netherlands because apparently the Dutch love cactuses. First day, first job after the dis dissertation. Um, then I took a job at Montrose, Colorado, working for Alpine Archaeology. I was commuting 14 hours each way, eight days on, six days off. That's not terribly stable for a marriage. It's not terribly stable for other things. I was offered a job at the Gila River Indian Reservation in which I would be commuting 80 miles each way to be an assistant field crew chief, which is what I could have done with a bachelor's degree, not a PhD. <laughs> But it had benefits, and you got to look realistically at those kinds of things. In any case, I accepted the Gila River position, then was in Montrose for one more stint when um, I had applied for a job, a postdoc position at the Field Museum, which if Barbara Mills was here, I would embarrass her yet again because she's the one who put me in touch with that postdoc position. So Barbara, wherever you are, thank you for doing that. But I got the job in Chicago, and we packed up the truck and the dog and the cat and everything else and moved to Chicago. In many ways, this was a homecoming for me. I'm from Chicago originally. I'm from the University of Chicago land. My mom was dean of students there. My dad actually worked at the Field Museum for many years as a child. He was editor of the Fieldiana series and the, the member monthly newsletter. I met Paul Martin when I was too young to remember it. But um, that's why my peculiar obsession with this man isn't quite so peculiar when you realize that I'm tracking down the activities of some old friends of mine. So please understand that this is not just some weird academic fixation on the whole thing. Um, in any case, so that's 1997. October 14th, 1997, I get to Chicago in the Field Museum. Dr. Jonathan Haas had gotten a National Science Foundation Collections Grant to catalog the Paul Sidney Martin collection at the Field Museum. Now, as we'll see, Paul Sidney Martin is one of the pillars of archaeological research in the American Southwest. You can put him and Emil Howery right up like this, and they will hold up the roof of Southwestern archaeology for decades. They did it in the 20th century. Paul Sidney Martin excavated more than 70 sites in his career, and he collected X number of objects. We didn't know how many objects. In fact, we didn't know how many sites he had excavated. Because what's interesting about his career is that he had a reputation. He had a stellar reputation amongst his peers for publishing a site report immediately after excavation. The crew would stay in the field for a month and do all the analysis. They would go back to Chicago. They would do the, some more analysis in Chicago. And then the spring semester, basically, was spent producing a finely polished monograph. Fantastic. He was doing it better than anybody else. But the fact is, he never published anything on half the sites he excavated. And worse, he never cataloged or had somebody cataloged 95% of the objects in his collections. There, we now know, because I counted them, there are 595,000 objects in Paul Martin's collection at the Field Museum. He never cataloged 95% of those. 
That means that 95% of this exquisite collection did not exist within the institutional memory of the Field Museum. So I set out to change that, first through the postdoc, and then I suckered them into hiring me as head of collections in the Department of Anthropology thereafter. And for seven more years, we worked to catalog all of the other uncatalogued collections at the Field Museum. Um, so since 2006, when I moved to Denver, I've been actively working to publish Paul Martin's record and to, and to keep working on this. And then for the future, what we hope to do is get a big multidisciplinary team working on the existing collections in Chicago, working in non-invasive strategies on some of the sites that he excavated and, and others that he didn't publish. I do need to mention also the other um, shortcoming of his was that most of the sites, many of the sites that he excavated during his career were never recorded with the federal or state authorities. Um, now, some of the sites that we'll see in Colorado, Lowry Ruin in particular, is a national monument. Yes, that's recorded with the state, with the federal authorities. Some that he was digging in New Mexico, it was all on Forest Service land. So his work, yeah, sort of recorded by the feds, but the sites weren't. In Arizona, as we'll see, he was working on private land, and that was deliberate on his part. He got tired of permits with the feds. He figured it's easier to give Joe Carter two pots at the end of the excavation season <laughs> than it is to write a report. Can't blame him. He's right. But the problem with the Arizona sites is that it's all on private land, and you have to go and get permission from individual landowners, and it's a much more difficult task. So. That's by way of introduction. We're going to be talking about people, places, and things today. By the way, anybody here looking for Paul Schulz Martin? If you are and you're interested in geosciences and the, paleo the megafaunal extinction, um, you're in the wrong place. You don't have to leave. But it's not Paul Schulz Martin we're talking about. And the Tucson Weekly made this mistake in 2007. They published an article about Paul Schulz Martin. They Googled him, or they Googled Paul Martin archaeologist and they got a photograph of Paul Sidney Martin. So we're talking about Paul Pottery not Martin, not Paul Pollen Martin. Okay? <laughs> Paul Pottery Martin. All right. People, places, and things. Paul Martin's career is easily divided into three phases. He wanted to be a Mayanist um, in the 1920s when he was a graduate school. He got Simultaneous cases of dysentery and malaria. His doctor said, you're not going back to Maya land, so he had to give that up. Um, he's in graduate school at the University of Chicago. It's a well-connected place. He has access to great scholars. Um, he wanted to go work in the American Southwest, and believe it or not, he actually got a job at the Colorado Historical Society in Denver, for whom he worked for two years from 1927 to 1929, digging sites in southwestern Colorado. But he was much more urbane than that. Denver was a cow town to him. He wanted to get back to an academic center like Chicago or Boston or something like that. He's a native Chicagoan. Um, Field Museum job opens up. He gets it. He goes to, sh to Chicago and says, we got to dig southwestern Colorado. But if you think back, A.V. Kidder, Alfred Vincent Kidder, the dean of southwestern archaeology at that time, said the southwest was a sucked orange meaning Mesa Verde land and Anasazi land. That was a sucked orange. He said, you don't want to dig there. There's, there's no more questions to be answered there. But Martin went back because he was a junior scholar at the Field Museum of Chicago, and his job was to reconstruct the exhibition, the outreach side of things, was to reconstruct the exhibition on southwestern archaeology for the Field Museum. So 1929, he goes, I'm sorry, 1930, he goes to Lowry Ruin in southwestern Colorado, moves 21 tons of dirt per day. Mule teams, railroad cars, mining cars, the whole bit. 21 tons of dirt per day. Sarah, we don't dig like that anymore, do we? I haven't dug in 20 years, so I don't know. But 21 tons of dirt is long, a lot of dirt. He goes back in 31. They don't go in 33 because of the Depression. I mean, 32. They go back in 33 and 34. But he's an academically trained archaeologist. He, needs to, he wants to do some research. He wants to do some culture history. So he goes back twice more in 37 and 38 to excavate basket maker sites, the earlier sites, to try and understand the full sequence of the region. What's telling, however, about his excavations in southwestern Colorado is that they were primarily driven by exhibi ex exhibition work, exhibits work. The Field Museum wanted him to bring back pretty stuff. So for the entire excavation of Lowry Ruin, a Chaco and Outlier, the largest Chaco and Outlier, there are 6,000 objects at the Field Museum. 21 tons of dirt per day, long field seasons, four field seasons, 6,000 objects. It's nothing, folks. There should have been that in one room up there. Um, so he doesn't bring back very much material. He spends a decade in southwestern Colorado, 
Yes, he's tired of Anasazi, but Emil Howery, his good friend down here in Tucson, had in 1936 published the type site of the Mogollon culture. And that starts the two decade, three decade, four decade long debate on whether or not Mogollon is actually a viable southwestern entity, an independent culture. So Paul Martin, who didn't always have his own original ideas, said, all right, let's go over into west central New Mexico. Emil, where's a good site to dig? Emil and Gila Pueblo Archaeological Foundation say, the shoe site, go dig the shoe site. So what does Martin do? 1939, he goes and digs the shoe site. And then he takes all of his stuff over to the University of Arizona Field School and says, Emil, will you look at this? It's Mogollon, right? And Emil says, yeah, it's Mogollon. And so he takes it back to Chicago and publishes it, publishes it as Mogollon. Digs there in 39 and 41 and then 46. And then the culture historian in him comes back out. They go for the earlier sites and then work their way on up to later sites. Then they also realized that they didn't have any cave sites excavated. They had no perishable remains. They didn't have any stratigraphy with which to check the seriation that they had done based on open air sites. So they find the gold mine, Tularosa Cave. They dig Tularosa Cave in 1950. They would, John Rinaldo, who I'll talk about in a little bit, um, would open up a phosphorus flare and they'd throw it into the cave and the laborers would dig, 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 dig until they couldn't breathe and then they'd go out and wait for the phosphorus flare to settle down. And then he'd torch another one and they'd go running in, dig, 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 dig. And they did this. <clears throat> What's interesting about Tularosa Cave, it's about, say, as big as this side of the room. Two by two meter squares, they were digging in two meter squares. Um, about 20 of those excavation units were put into the cave they pulled out God knows how much, how many, uh, just tremendous amounts of stuff. They stayed in the field to analyze it, um, but they only published the two deepest levels up at the front. Square 2R1 and 2R2 were more or less completely published. The real fancy objects found in the other squares were published, and then the rest of it was ignored. Perishable remains. There are 33,000 corn cobs from Tularosa Cave. I know because I counted them. There's 250 sandals in Tularosa Cave. Why is that? Why so many sandals and not any other clothing? There's knots, there's quids, there's beans, there's all kinds of crazy stuff from Tularosa Cave, and they never, it, 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 there's, there's no other site like it, I think, but most interestingly for them is that the, the stratigraphic column at Tularosa Cave confirmed the seriation that they had established via open air sites. Now, We've just gotten some AMS radiocarbon dates back on some of those sandals, and lots of people have said that Tularosa Cave stratigraphy is messed up. Yes, it's messed up. But I'm going to keep asking you this. If it's messed up, and if it was excavated by old excavation techniques, and if it's therefore no good, why are we keeping it in museums? It's expensive to do so. Um, Tularosa Cave, there was something else I was going to say about that site. It'll come back to me in a minute. Anyway, OSHA would have had a field day with those guys. That was not a safe excavation. Oh, I know what it was. Very presciently, Paul Martin left a bulk in Tularosa Cave. There's nothing left in there. You can go see some corn cobs and things. He left a bulk there. The responsible thing to do for future archaeologists, leave some of the site. The bulk was destroyed within three years. Local looters came in and, and tore it out. Um, anyway, so they're digging in, in Reserve New Mexico, in West Central New Mexico, until 1955, and then they figure they've got the basic pattern figured out. They think that the, that the Mogollon became the Zuni, but they think in order to, before they did that, they went over into um, East Central Arizona. So 1956, they go over to East Central Arizona, and they do basically the same thing. They do a survey, they find some early sites, they find some later sites, and this is all classic culture history. 1956, 57, 58, 59, and so on. But in the late 1950s, something very interesting happened in southwestern archaeology. Number one, Bill Longacre, who had been a student of one of Paul Martin's students, goes to the Field Museum and gets a job with Paul Martin. Uncle Willie is impressionable. He's a, he's a young guy. He hasn't been around the block a whole lot. In 1961, Lewis Binford shows up at the, at the University of Chicago, where Longacre is a graduate student. And Longacre becomes interested in what's called the New Archaeology at the time. The New Archaeology at the time well, had as three basic tenets a, a strong emphasis on sampling theory, um, strong emphasis on hypothesis testing, and, and a, a reasonably strong emphasis on cultural ecology, trying to figure out how people were making a living. It was less interested in culture, time, um, space time systematics, figuring out who lived where, when. Binford, by the way, 
gets his job at the University of Chicago. He wasn't ABD. He wasn't all but dissertation. He was JBM. He was just barely masters. <laughs> he didn't defend his dissertation for another three years after getting to the University of Chicago. Can you imagine that today? Getting a job at a preeminent university like that, that far away from, from his master's degree. Now, I mean from his PhD. I said that to Jeff Reed, whom you all know and love, and Jeff Reed started laughing and he said that's because Binford took so long to defend his dissertation because Jimmy Griffin was a bulldog. He was a bulldog with a terabyte of memory, is what Jeff Reed said. And so it took a while. So there was politics and other things, but Binford was three years away from defending his dissertation when he was at the University of Chicago. So, um, everything changes in East Central Arizona over here when they're digging on private land and all of a sudden they start collecting huge numbers of objects because they want to preserve, they want to excavate an extinct social system. They're doing more than just time-space systematics. I was at the Arizona State Museum today. I'm publishing a paper on John Ronaldo. Yeah, let me, let me go to John Ronaldo. Back here in New Mexico, folks. Paul Martin in Colorado had used local laborers primarily, Al Lancaster and others, to help him do his excavations, but it was basically his show. In 1938, a fellow by the name of John Ronaldo, a peculiar man from Chicago, volunteers on one of those digs with Charles DePeso, who would later become director of the Amarind Foundation. But Charles DePeso and John Ronaldo volunteer in southwestern Colorado, and Paul Martin sings the praises of John Ronaldo. He's just doing everything perfectly. It's all great. So Ronaldo goes back um, into the field in New Mexico with Paul Martin in 1939. And he was supposed to go back in 1940, but the Field Museum didn't have any money. Then 1940, Ronaldo was supposed to go back for the second season at the shoe site, but uh, his draft number was 70, and he gets inducted in the Army. So he goes off to World War II. He's in the Battle of the Bulge, Battle of Rhineland, and so on. Comes back to Chicago in 1946. He accepts a job for $1 per year, 1946. 1950, he gets promoted to a curatorial position for the equivalent today of $22,000. And in 1960, he was promoted um, to uh, uh, the next level up in curatorial position for the equivalent of $34,000 today. John Ronaldo was the quintessential culture historian. When they're working in New Mexico, he's responsible for the field work. He's responsible for most of the cataloging. Indeed, he's responsible for much of the analysis that leads to the publication of those monographs each year. Ronaldo is still on the scene when they go over into Arizona, but Longacre shows up. He's the new kid on the block. Then Binford shows up. And I was at the Arizona State Museum today looking for a photograph that Bill Longacre told me about. And remember I told you the new archaeology is about sampling? random sampling and so on. Bill Longacre has a photograph of John Fritz, eminent archaeologist, standing there taking notes as John Ronaldo, who's been digging for a quarter century, has tremendous amounts of experience, is looking through a table of random numbers to decide which rooms to dig at Broken Cay Pueblo. John Ronaldo's hands are on fire. You can see his head about to explode. <laughs> This is, it's not to make fun of John Ronaldo. It is to say that this is a point of inflection. This is a turning point in the history of Southwestern archaeology because it was no longer okay for folks like Emil Howery and Paul Martin and others to just go and dig a site and describe it and point it out where it exists in space and time. They had to be doing something more. And quite frankly, John Ronaldo couldn't handle it. He would have none of it. And shortly after that random number table business at Broken Cay Pueblo, he resigned his position of 25 years at the Field Museum, walked away from a, a tenured position, and came to Tucson where he went to the Amarin Foundation in Dragoon and worked on the publication of the Casas Grandes site report, which is nothing if not quintessential culture history. It is, it is you know, the Casas Grandes site in time and space, and you describe it and you describe everything from it. So John Ronaldo is critical, and coming back to the whole collections, I will tell you that the collections made and cataloged under John Ronaldo's tutelage, really under Paul Martin's tutelage, but Ronaldo was the one handling it, the collections from New Mexico are in much better shape. So get back over to um, Arizona. Um, things transition in about 1962-63. Then Paul Martin starts getting National Science Foundation money in support of his research. It's hypothesis testing like crazy. You wouldn't believe the stuff that they're coming up with. But more problematic for collections and existing museum collections and what archaeologists actually do is that they change their recording system. You guys remember punch cards on computers? They were not intuitive, were they? 
I'm going like this. If I went like this, my kids would recognize a, a, an iPad screen or something. But those punch cards went past you like that. The provenience information that they used to handle random sampling and computer analysis in the 1960s renders much of the collection from Arizona unusable because the provenience in information will say X, Y, 1, 0 over, over slash 0, 1, blah, 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 DD, all of this kind of stuff. Sometimes you can find the concordance sheets to figure out where those actually came from in a site. Most times you can't. To make matters worse, Again, they thought that they were excavating prehistoric social systems, and we can argue about that or not, but they also started doing things like using eighth-inch screen. So from the Hatch site, named after the Hatch car dealership in Sholo, Arizona, that you all may know, they used eighth-inch screen in a massive lithic scatter and collected 80,000 pieces of debitage that are a millimeter long. I know, because I counted them. <laughs> um, in any case, um, all is not lost. I mean, the, the, the Field Museum curates the 600,000 collections in Paul Martin's collection. What I've taken to doing is looking at it as a de facto history of North American archaeology. What these people did is represented in what's on the shelves. So the point now is to try and get into um, what we can do with those collections, because if we can't do anything with them because somehow they're messed up, why are we spending the money to curate them? God's honest truth, I'll ask that question for a very long time. Thoughts, questions, comments at this point? I will say also that Paul Martin traveled in style. He was an urbane, uh, gregarious man who, um, he used to bribe the porters on the Southwest Chief train from Chicago to Gallup so that he could bring his dog Spot onto the train. He would pick his trains for the, for the individual porters that he wanted his field camp in Pine Lawn, New Mexico, which I've been trying to find, it was destroyed after they left it, was outfitted with Navajo rugs and a stereo system, electric generator, refrigerator, the whole bit. And in fact, this comes into effect Grasshopper Pueblo, the, the field school for the University of Arizona, in that everybody was envious of both the Pine Lawn and the Vernon field camps because they were so luxurious. They were envious, but they also said, oh, look at those guys, they're, they're just not tough. They can't do anything. Um, so anyway, I think that, that w this introduction to Paul Martin and, and his work should be getting you to think about the ethics of collecting. What do museums collect and why? The analog for the Colorado work would be Byron Cummings at the Arizona State Museum. You're collecting ostensibly as an archaeologist, but really you're collecting type specimens and you're collecting for exhibition. Again, the New Mexico portion, really the, the type person is Emil Howery, culture, history, and then some. Um, but Howery and Martin had a falling out in the 1960s over the new archaeology. Howery couldn't deal with it. He said, you've gone off the deep end, Paul. I can't handle it. And in fact, Paul's conversion to the new archaeology is, is metaphysical. It's, it's, uh, it's emotional. It's quasi-religious. He really, there's a letter in the Arizona State Museum archives in which he said, I've dumped all of my research prior to 1962. And I read that letter in 2000, um, when I was, uh, shortly after my postdoc was over, when I was still looking for the Martin archives. And I read that letter and put it, the box away, and I went across the street to get a lot of beer. Because <laughs> uh, I was terrified that he literally dumped his research. He hadn't, but his archives don't exist in one set of papers. But his, his conversion was epiphanic, and it affected the development of Southwestern archaeology here in Tucson, as well as elsewhere, because Schiffer, Mike Schiffer and Bill Rathje and Bill Longacre and a whole bunch of other folks came out of that Vernon Field School. You can, in fact, seriate the Field School uh, crew shots by their haircuts because Schiffer's fro gets bigger, <laughs> like, a, like a chia pet, you know. <laughs> 1967, it's not that big, and then by 72, it's huge. You all remember those days. Anyway, enough from me right now. Museums are full of wonderful, wonderful collections, and I won't really say let's get rid of everything, but I will say we have to think deeply about what we keep, why we keep it, and what we can do with it. And if we really can't do very much, then, then maybe we should think about the word deaccession, which museum folks don't like to hear. So thank you for the, the time for the introduction. I'd be happy to take so questions. I'll bring the microphone out to you, and uh, I'd like you to give your question uh, into the microphone so we can record it. If you were to decide not to curate some collection, what exactly would you do with it? Very good question. What would we do with a collection if we decided not to curate it? Well, I'll, I'll set it, sell it, possibly, possibly. Um, I'll set it up with an example. Um, I worked at the Field Museum for nine years. Undeniably one of the world's best anthropology collections on the planet. 
um, systematically collected from some of the most fascinating sites around the world, um, it's hard to think about getting rid of some of those collections. I move out to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, which has a much different history that we didn't have all of the curators at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science first had PhDs in 2006. We had 100% PhD representation in 2006. We didn't have our first National Science Foundation grant till 1983. After Hannah Marie Wormington and a couple of other people, we really didn't have PhD curators on staff until the 1980s. Very, very different history. Not systematically collected stuff. Literally, one curator purchased a human foot at a yard sale in 1975 and brought it to the collections, and it was accessioned into the collections. <laughs> when I got there um, in 2006, I then hired somebody whom you all may know, Chip Caldwell Chantapone, in 2007. And Chip is firmly in the world of ethically grounded archaeology. And what we set out to do was, was we, we created an aspiration statement. We needed a goal. And I said, we need to curate the best understood anthropology collection in North America. And he said, yeah, but we also need to curate the most ethically held anthropology collection in North America. So that's our aspiration statement. We, you know, we aspire to curate the best understood and most ethically held collection in North America. What we've been doing over the last several years, I should note, we built a brand new facility for all of the collections that are, it's all going to be moved in. So what we don't want to do is move in problematic collections because they take up space, become legacy issues, and then they're forgotten. What do you do when you deaccession things? The, the Field Museum's policy, as well as the Denver Museum's policy, says that you first try to find an educational institution or repository that will accept the material and use it for educational purposes. Um, sale, you can sell objects. It's a little bit tricky because you can, there are people who don't think you should be selling anything from museums. Um, we have policies about nobody connected with the museum can, can purchase anything. Um, ultimately, sometimes you destroy it. And that's um, going to sound like heresy to, to, to some museum folks, but I've seen tons of material out there that has no provenience information, is busted up pieces, is redundant, is all of that kind of stuff. And we've got to get real about what Linda Cordell called two decades ago the curation crisis, because it's real. Our, our repositories are busting at the seams. So most institutions have policies about what you do. You try and get it to go to educational institutions or other museums first, and then it trickle down a long list of things. But we wouldn't we won't sell them on the open market typically what are the consequences are you saying this discard it mm -hmm. of the of uh, being cultural material and tribal mm -hmm. resistance to that idea and secondly what what about the possibility of in the future there being some kind of radiometric ability to to identify provenance in a way that, that is unequivocal. Right. I don't know, but I mean that is a possibility. Right. I suppose. Uh, thank you for the questions. So the questions was twofold: is one, what about tribal um, interests for these things? And we're actively engaged with tribes all the time. And um, in fact, with the human remains, with the ancestors in our collections, we've been actively ahead of the law in dealing with with Native American ancestors. So we've been proactively engaging tribes from all around the country to consult with us on what to do. And there's many, many deeper issues involved with human remains that, that I probably may not have time, maybe we have time to go into. Um, but we consult with tribes when we believe it's appropriate. And, and so our default position is to consult with them more rather than less. Because part of the problem is that, is that the tribes weren't consulted when, these, when the, a lot of these sites were dug in the first place. So um, our default position is to, is to do more consultation rather than less. The second question you had was what about new techniques coming along? Interestingly enough, Tularosa Cave corn cobs were used in the first radiocarbon dates that were ever published. Be why? Because Willard Libby was four miles away at the University of Chicago. He came to the Field Museum. He took a chunk off of an Egyptian boat. Radiocarbon dating back in the, in the day took kilograms of material. So he took a chunk off an Egyptian boat, went and put it in the machine and got a date out of it. He went and got bags and bags and bags of corn cobs out of Tularosa Cave and did the same thing with it. It is true that new techniques are going to come along. The challenge that I have for the discipline is that the collections that we have in our museums are grossly underutilized right now. People would rather go do field work. They would rather destroy a site because that's the ethos. That's the field work. That's fun is to go and dig. Everybody loves that. That's why we got into archaeology. But it's times are changing. But still, most people would rather go dig my site because the other sites were dug using old techniques, old recording techniques, old um, 
old questions, research questions, and you end up in a situation where it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where the collections get ignored. I do know that new techniques will come along and, and be of use on some of these collections. The, the place where I would make a distinction is on material that has no provenience information whatsoever. You have no idea where it came from, and then the systematically excavated materials. So, and let's be honest, we've got millions of objects in all of our repositories. There's redundancy there. So, Steve, I have the uh, Archaeology Southwest magazine issue. You have an article in there on uh, the Paul Martin's history, and there's two images, historical images, and yes. they show people having breakfast, mm -hmm. and another group of the, the field school students. <clears throat> there's a gender imbalance. Um, ah. All males, 1965, yes. 1966. Right. Um, did Paul allow women to Absolutely. at his field schools? Yeah, thank you for that question, Bill. Um, Paul Martin has, uh, there's a couple of things that are assumed about Paul Martin. Number one, that he was gay, which he was not. Um, and number two, that he was a misogynist, which he was not. Interestingly enough, in the 1930s, not in the 1930s when he's in Colorado, I don't believe that there were any women out in the field with him. But in the 1940s, there was a surprising number of women working with him in the field. Most notably, Elaine Bloom Harold, who's here in Tucson. Uh, she was Elaine Bloom at the time, but also Eloise Barter. And then there's other people who are in the picture and out of the picture, interns from Antioch College and so on. So you look at some of the photographs from the 1940s, and there's not quite gender balance, but maybe it's 60-40. Then when they move over to Colorado, just by chance, there are fewer women in the picture. Um, and then he starts getting uh, National Science Foundation money in 1960, 61, 62, so on. In 1968, the National Science Foundation uh, required gender balance on any project that they were funding. And you can see the, the, the staff photographs change um, automatically. And what's fascinating is that some of the women there um, didn't buy into the hierarchical relationship that Paul Martin liked to establish at these things. They would end up being the ones who would call his bluff and say, Paul, you, you know, come on, you get off it, man. You're, you're, you're just, and the guys would all be standing at attention, basically. <laughs> and, and the women, and, and it's fascinating. There's um, Susan Anderson, I think her name is, and she took a special amount of glee in playing that role, and it was a very good thing. I've never been able to find anything about, really anything about Martin's personal life. He, di he never married. A uh, rumor at the Field Museum has it that he was engaged to be married when J. Eric S. Thompson, a Mayanist, comes back to the Field Museum, and he's this dashing Mayanist who's just come back from the jungles and studying Tikal or wherever, what it, whatever it is, and he steals away Paul Martin's fiance. Can't prove it. That's what I've heard. Um, the other thing that he did, interestingly enough, was he would take young men into the field with him, they, the young men that lived near him in the northern suburbs of Chicago. So there's this kid that appears in, in an inordinate number of photographs in a very tight T-shirt, good-looking young kid. His name is Todd Egan. Ten years ago, I Googled him, nothing. About a month and a half ago, I Googled him. Todd Egan is alive and well and living in the northern suburbs of Chicago. He's on vacation now. He comes back to, the, to home on the 13th next Monday. I'm calling him. <laughs> if, he says, if he says it's okay to come up and give an oral history, I'm getting on a plane the next day. Because the single biggest regret of my peculiar obsession here is the fact that I didn't make the five-hour drive to see John Ronaldo in Des Moines, Iowa before he died. I was maintaining a correspondence with him, but I didn't have any money. I was a postdoc. Well, that's why God invented credit cards, right? You <laughs> slap it down and you go. I missed a chance to meet a preeminent guy in southwestern archaeology because I didn't have any money. And that was real, but you know, you, you change things. So Todd Egan, critical player in this. So coming back to the women thing, it ebbs and flows. But if you look from 68 to 75, there's a lot of really smart women who are calling his bluff. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Um, so I, I've been looking at some records from, um, from the late years of Paul Martin's field school, and they include some names of Snowflake High School field school students, and I was curious, um, did he often bring in local um, students to his, um, to his um, field schools or other local community members, and you know, have you ever talked to those folks? Um, that's a dissertation in itself, tracking all those folks down. But um, yes, he did bring students. Todd Egan is one of them. He also adopted a kid by the name of Marshall Finan. And A. Marshall Finan went on to a, a prominent career in the federal government. And I don't think it's the same Marshall Finan, but how many Marshall Finans can there be? Um, <laughs> there are 
there were Antioch College students that were interning at the Field Museum for many, many years. Um, Charles de Peso was a high school student who volunteered for Paul Martin in 1938. And Charles de Peso was a bad boy. He went out on a weekend long trip in his dad's car with two young ladies in 1938. And there's an extensive correspondence between Martin and DePeso's dad figuring out the bills for this trip. Um, uh, there were students around, yeah, there were some high school students, but it got to a point where what Paul Martin said was that he didn't want to take volunteers because if he was paying a man's salary, quote unquote, it was easier to hold him to a line than it was a volunteer. A volunteer could just say, you know what, I'm done with it, and if, but if it was somebody who was employed. So high school students are in there. By the way, Sarah brought up something. If you look at the roster of archaeologists that went through the, the Vernon Field Camp in the 1960s, it really is a who's who of southwestern archaeology. Norman Yaffe, um, and the names are going to escape me, Hill, jo, uh, Jim Hill, John Fritz, Fred Plogg, uh, Mark Leone, uh, James Schoenwetter, uh, the list goes on and on and on, and there are lots of surprises in those photographs, people that you all will recognize when you go through there, and some of them are just exquisite photographs. Was there much interest in cultural anthropology on the uh, uh, half of uh, Martin? And also, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how his weeks went or a day went oh, in nice, his work? Nice question. Sure, I'd love to. Uh, was there cultural anthropology in his work? Interestingly enough, Remember I said that they were chasing prehistoric social organization in the new archaeology? That actually started out in New Mexico. Um, and John Ronaldo was involved in some of it, but it was Paul Martin and George Quimby and Don Collier, three curators at the Field Museum, published a book called Indians Before Columbus. It was the best-selling textbook of its kind. And they published it. Um, but they were publishing it while they were going to the University of Chicago and teaching a museum anthropology class. So late 1940s, they're deeply involved with the, museum, with the University of Chicago, which is a haven for cultural anthropology at that time. George Peter Murdoch's book, um, Social, Organization, uh, Social Organization of the Western Pueblos, is that it? Uh, comes out in 1949, and that's when they say, oh, Cultural anthropologists are interested in social organization. Maybe anthropologists can recreate social organization from the stuff that we're finding in the sites. So they point to George Peter Murdoch's book, which they read at the, at the University of Chicago. That's 1949. It happens a little bit like that through the 1950s. Um, in the 1960s, the, the new archaeology is, is, is using cultural anthropology theory, but I wouldn't call it cultural anthropology as well, because they were doing really bizarre hypothesis testing. Um, it's almost to the point where I can't even come up with one of these things because they're so, they're so off the wall. Um, but Paul Martin always thought that archaeology could be used to solve the world's problems, that archaeology was a laboratory, that we could get answers for the world's social ills. So in that sense, cultural anthropology was behind it, but there weren't many cultural anthropologists involved. As far as I can tell, Paul Martin never um, collaborated or consulted with Native American tribes. Now, I will say... Bill Longacre has told me that at Hooper Ranch Pueblo, they were digging in a great kiva, and they dug around the center of this great kiva, and in there was a crypt. You peel back the lid, you lift off the top, and there's a little human figurine. Let me see if I can draw him. Um, little guy like that, and he had... Native American cardinal direction colors on his body. And he was in a crypt with a little bowl or something like that. And as I said, Martin never consulted with Native Americans, but Bill Longacre swears that within two days after the discovery of that, a delegation of Hopi elders showed up. Who knows? That's what he said. Mm -hmm. How were these artifacts going to help? My question is, how were these artifacts going to help world peace or something. That's what it sounds like when you say it's going to solve uh, contemporary problems. Uh, that's a good question because I'm not sure. The question was how are these artifacts going to help solve world problems. A lot of archaeologists will make the claim that the work that we're doing is helping us learn about sustainability or other kinds of things. Paul Martin looked at current events and tried to make his archaeology relevant through those current events. So those of you who were around at the end of World War II may remember the term um, dispossessed or displaced or something. They didn't call people homeless, but if you were homeless, you were dispossessed or displaced, something like that. I don't remember exactly. 
And one of the things that he does then is goes and interprets some of the New Mexican sites in, under the guise of homeless people migrating in and becoming dispossessed. He did this all through the member magazine of the Field Museum. So he had his professional outlet through the monographs, but then he used the member magazine, and that's where he would float these trial balloons of ideas about how, um, how archaeology can help us inform or learn about what's happening in modern society, either through uh, the, the end of World War II and homelessness or economic problems of some kind. But I would say it's a stretch, yeah. How did Martin get started with the Pleistocene? <laughs> How did Martin get started with the Pleistocene? He didn't. That's the other Paul Martin. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> no, actually, no, you bring up something important. The random number generation thing, there is a site somewhere in East Central Arizona called the Vernon site. It's also called the Meneer site after the family that was there. There's also some people named the Heap, so Longacre liked to call it the Heap Meneer site for whatever reason. <laughs> It is a massive, massive lithic scatter that the site location says it's located on a bench 10 miles southeast of St. John's, Arizona. Everything's on a beach, 10 on a bench 10 miles southeast of St. John's, Arizona. I can't find the site. But when they excavated it, they laid it out in four by four meter grids, used a random number generator. Sorry, they didn't excavate all of it. They did surface collecting. So we've got these units and these bags of stuff. Andy Hemmings, who's also a U of A graduate student, has come in to look at it, because Martin's crew, Longacre and Graves, published that there was a Folsom component there, but Andy Hemmings comes in and look at the, looks at it, and he says there's a Clovis technology component to this, that the Clovis points aren't there, but the reduction techniques that are being used, it's Clovis. Doggone it, it would be nice to know where that site is, wouldn't it? There are, no, there are scarcely any Clovis points from East Central Arizona, and there are no Clovis sites from up there that I know of. Wouldn't it be cool if we could find the Vernon site? So the work is not done. We're not getting rid of the Martin Collection at the Field Museum. I couldn't even if I wanted to, and I don't want to. But uh, the work has to keep going. Remember, there's 35 unpublished sites up there. And 95% of that collection, 575,000 objects have never been published in any way, shape, or form. Many shouldn't be published. They're just, they're just detritus. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done on those collections. You talked about uh, the Denver Museum, which I grew up with and loved it. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about uh, you know, aspire to have the best systematic and mm -hmm. ethical collections. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's the criteria for accepting collections. Do you go beyond that and be proactive and try to encourage what you consider to be systematic and ethically collected collections? Yep. So the question is, how do we take an ethically grounded curation forward? And this is not to say that other curators have not been ethically grounded. It's just to say that we're we're putting that front and center on what we do. What it means is that we're going through the collections of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, trying to weed out the junk and, and get that material used by society somehow, in, either in educational facilities, in museums that can really use it, or other things. I want to make use of existing museum collections, sort of like the Archaeology Southwest Preservation Ethos, we shouldn't dig any more non-threatened archaeological sites until we've got the material already in museums taken care of. Now, that's not going to get you a job in many universities, but that's what I really believe. So coming back to the New Mexico material, what's interesting about this place, Paul Martin left New Mexico in 1955. The Pine Lawn Field Camp was destroyed sometime in the middle 1960s. Forest Service wiped it out. You can go see where it was, but there's no map of the, of the, of the field camp and so on. Um, What's interesting about that part of the world is that effectively there's been no original research in this part of the world in half a century. There's been some road widening projects, there's been a couple of field schools that are poorly published, but doggone it if that's not a gap in our understanding of the American Southwest. So my goal for the next 10 years is to pull together the dream team of experts. I've got the curatorial expertise, I know that collection frankly better than anybody else. I will be the, 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 the hub that will be used, what I would like to do, is to get experts in to analyze the heck out of the collection in the field museum, all the while doing new work on the ground that includes ground penetrating radar, which we've done for the last couple of years, which might include drone survey, which might include just properly recording the sites, which will include um, uh, studies of ancient religion in that part of the world, or environmental work that hasn't been done. But if you compare the Pine Lawn Reserve area down here with you know, our knowledge of northwestern uh, New Mexico, it, 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 it pales in comparison. Even the Mimbres or Casas Grandes, there hasn't been that intensive effort over the last two decades in the Pine Lawn Reserve area, and that's what I want to change. 
Because then what we can do is, is actively work on the collection that's in Chicago and elsewhere and say this is how you, you take advantage of museum collections and do modern archaeology. You do it together. Amazingly, Steve has managed to compress the time-space continuum over the last uh, 50 minutes here. You've had a three-hour lecture and <laughs> your, your dogs and cats and children at home are wondering where you are. Right, right. <laughs> no, amazing presentation, thank Steve, you. and thank you very much. Thanks for all your time and attention.